Extra, extra, this just in, the voice of Johnny Papes bravely and proudly returns to the Small Beans Network as part of a start plate bumper designed to get your money. If you head to patreon.com slash small beans and give us upwards of five dollary dues a month, you will get twice as many bold, brazen podcasts, including Star Trek The Next Futurama, One Upsmanship, Spiel Boys, Help Me, Patreon.com slash Small Beans. He li- I live in his pocket, he doesn't feed me, please help. to talk first you or me michael i guess you because that was it we're rolling we're live dude we're on okay and it's a live show there's an audience surprise there's not just at your house yeah i just sent him (laughs) over to abe's place Okay, people are filing in. Uh, (laughs) What what tier is is randomly send people (laughs) to abe's house yeah, it's uh, it's, I, yeah. dude, it's hard to make money in this economy, man. It's the tier where I have incriminating photos of you, and I call you at three a.m. and I say, "Hey, hey, asshole, I got a funny idea. Wake up!" <laughs> that, no, that was my grandmother's very baked potato, which is mm-hmm. a segue to say segue. that he's in my house and someone no, else. He's, no. yeah, uh, <laughs> he's coming at me. Uh, he's very baked. I, <laughs> I am Abe Epperson, and I'm here with my cohort. Yeah, the, yeah, cohort I think implies multiple, so that's true. Let's just dispense mm-hmm. with the usual hiding yeah. things behind curtains. I'm Michael Swain. Guests, you already talked. I Go did. Hi, yeah. this is Tom Ryman. Uh so yeah, I guess two of us is technically a cohort. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah. Through the Patreon, you can go to this uh, place called uh, Pick the Flick Tier. <laughs> and just for some scratch, you can, two can choose the movie we cover uh, with some exceptions. Like we're not going to watch like your porno, you freaks. Um, but mm-hmm. Very Baked Potato is the one to thank for this episode. He requested Thomas. And oh, hey. the movie All right. is 2007 Sunshine. Kind well, of stumbled through the beginning of that. I feel like the audience is throwing you, but you know, dude, just imagine them naked, which I paid them to be, so they yeah, better. Now be. I'm insecure because I thought I did really well, and you're telling me that was hot dog crap. I remember improv anywhere? Basically, uh-huh. they're all old people now, and I told them to hereditary you. That's what's going on. Oh, that's, that's what why to they're expect. banging their head <laughs> yeah, against that's the right. ceiling. Yeah, right. oh, yeah. I had a feeling uh, I was cute. being hereditary. <laughs> yeah, are like, you man, I feel me? I feel like some <laughs> septuagenarian ghoul is standing just in the shadows, kind of smiling at me right My now. Eyes turn are ah, yeah, there he is. I yeah, knew it. Yeah. There he there is. is. There's that dick. Get out. Uh okay, this time I'll drag us back on track. Um, for very baked potatoes sake, if no one else is. Tom, would you yeah. mind kicking the conversation off by telling the listeners? Had you seen Sunshine before? Do you like Sunshine? Don't like Sunshine? Has Game fully covered Sunshine? Like, what's your relationship to this film? Yes, I like it. No. <laughs> uh, I saw, I've only seen Sunshine once before, and I saw it in 2007 when it came out. Uh, so it had been a long ass time. Uh, but like, like most Alex Garland movies, this is written by Alex Garland, directed by Danny Boyle. So already got some talent behind the camera. Uh, but mm. uh, like all of Alex Garland's movies or shows that I've seen, like it really sticks in my head. So like mm-hmm. I was surprised watching this, gosh, 16 years later, how much of it I still remembered. Um, I really oh, like this movie. Yeah. Uh, I think it's a great sci-fi thriller. I like how efficient the script is. I love the characterization. Um, mm-hmm. I... It's a theme that I think is really interesting. I'm sure we'll get into it, but it's like it's like the identical theme to Annihilation, just about one of Alex Garland's other movies. True. Um, It's it's just a it and it was so cool. It was like so unlike anything else that came out that year in my memory, 2007. Mm -hmm. Um, It was just a really and it was like a Danny Boyle. It was in the middle of his like like. Like I had sort of always regarded him as like awards guy or like, I don't know, prestige drama. But then he starts doing these genre films like 28 Days Later and Sunshine. I was like, oh, OK. Um, 
Mm-hmm. It was just I, I was really into this movie. Um, uh, we've never covered it on on Gamefully, I don't believe. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, I have lots of hot takes about it, but I don't want to awesome put those oh, in right yeah. now. But yeah, it's... yeah, yeah, we'll get there very soon, though. So clearly, uh, literally, two thousand seven. Yeah, man. that's true. Ah! <laughs> clearly, in two thousand seven, someone didn't see No Sunshine for Old Men, where Anton Sugar becomes a crazy sun demon and kills everyone. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that Woo! happened. I also want to mention up top, because I mainly like to talk about the story itself, and it sounds like that's going to be the vibe. Um, the cast is stacked. I, I had seen this shit. before, but I completely forgot that it's got Cliff Curtis, Killian Murphy, Michelle Yeoh, uh, Rose Byrne, Benedict Wong, Chris Evans, <laughs> Mark Strong as aforementioned Sun Demon. Mm-hmm. Uh, insane. And larger cast than I remembered. Like, it feels yeah. so bodily. The- and, and I guess uh, it becomes very bodily because most of them die. There's nine people. But yeah, and there's a lot. Of, like seven of them, you are yeah. like household names at this point. There's a lot of bodies to kill. Nerds. Yeah, it's it's well stocked. It, really, the old, uh, and the captain is, um, oh gosh, he played Scorpion in the most recent Mortal Kombat. Um, oh, I feel embarrassed. The Sonata. That I'm yes, uh, yes. Uh, Hiro Yuki Hiro Yuki Sonata. Sonata, yeah. Sonata, Sonata, yeah. And he was also in Bullet Train. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I was just like, out of the main cast, it's just the one guy that plays Harvey is probably the guy that nobody knows. <laughs> Apologies and that to guy, Troy Garrity. I'm, sh- <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that if you look, like, he's right, still I'm a sh- guy that when I look at him, I'm like, you've been in stuff. I'm sure yeah, he's been yeah, in sure. a billion. But it is, it is like, yeah, I remembered this cast being good. Like, I remembered Cliff Curtis um killian murphy and uh uh chris evans chris evans uh, but and, Burn, and michelle yo but i didn't remember yeah. michelle yo i didn't remember scorpion i didn't remember benedict wong scorpion uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah it's all over. and mark strong is frankly barely in the picture well because you can't he only see appears. him yeah. you barely you can they, barely they, see they have him. a shooting strategy where they're like let's never show the creature he does um, have that one monologue in the video diary Right, but that's it's so, true. It's so but even that's, that's close whole, up on that's his, his big scene. You can only really see his eyes. Yeah, but yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, Pickman, yeah, 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 pinbacker, yeah, yeah. pinbacker, pinbacker, pinbacker. He yeah. lives inside a fortress. Hey, reference hey. for San Diego <laughs> fans of pinback. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, Abe, you haven't check. given your spiel yet, and then let's do hot takes because that's basically yeah, what it's the for. The least right? hot take that you uh, really could have. Yeah. Um, it, because it's the one that, like, you search this. This is what film criticism. Think. I know what you're gonna say. Yeah. yeah and um, you watch this. It's all over Reddit. Uh, every Reddit post is this. Basically, uh, angry at the movie for having their act three what it was which I think we'll probably unpack a little bit because there's some truth to it and there's also some like, ah, fuck off. Uh, Because the big thing is that the first two acts, it's very clear that like, it's it's like a science fiction movie. It's not a horror slasher or anything like that. It's just two acts where the villain quote unquote is the sun everything that all the problems that come up you know like uh the reflections of the dish aren't quite adequate or mathematically correct so it burns a hole through their ship they lose oxygen you know it's just madness and it's really well done and everyone really likes that part and then some people are bothered and i have to say that in 2007 i was also bothered um but i've kind of maybe a little bit more terms with it or i see what they're doing which is act three is definitely feels out of place because it turns into a ultimately like a slasher horror movie where mark strong the captain of the previous uh, failed mission of the Icarus. This is the Icarus two. He was the Icarus one has been like s- s- living on that ship for seven months, gets on the Icarus two and just starts off and heads because he is, uh, you know, like a, a yeah. zealot for the sun. He Why would you it's fucking God. call it Icarus after Icarus famously yeah. failed, but not even that. The first one also failed. The first one also like, failed. Yeah. Let's name the second one in honor let's of the first one in Titanic honor of that dude. Titanic who failed. two, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Titan Icarus. Um, but yeah, yeah, that first that first two thirds kind of feels like Apollo thirteen or gravity. It's like shit is just going wrong. And it's awesome. 
and it's yeah, awesome because the way it's that. yeah 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 so that's the kind of um you know film school kind of criticism and i'm not saying mm. it's wrong it's just one of the types of criticism that you see a lot where it's like what if it different movie yeah right. and what if it was my the age movie I, that it was yeah right and in my age i'm like you know what that's it's, they did what they want. And I started to read a little bit more about what Alex Garland wanted to do with the script, what Danny Boyle wanted to do with the script. And I think ultimately, like, I, think- I see that I see what they're approaching is pretty sound. He wanted to do like a Lovecraftian thing where the larger theme at play is that the unknown drives you mad. You can't look at God and, in the eye. Yeah. yeah. Right. And There's so, that repeated and- motif of eyes and the only people who are safe are looking at the sun through some sort of barrier. <laughs> yeah. Some Trump can of... do it. Trump's good. Trump uh, I, but yeah, I, I noticed it big time this time, which I didn't as a young man. And I really like it, which is there's constant imagery comparing the sun to an eye, like it, which is so easy. Something goes in front of the sun. And right when it hits the center, you're like, that's an eye. That's and an spe- eyeball. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and specifically it's, it's the eye of God or the eye of yeah, creation. It's looking at you, bud. And like, you yes. can't withstand it. And that is a great right. metaphor. It's or a God perfect. looks at you and it obliterates you. <laughs> yeah. It's a perfect metaphor for, like I mentioned earlier, uh, I guess I just I'll get this out real quick. Um, Please, and I guess maybe Abe can tell me how close I was to their intent. But like, it feels like this movie. I mentioned Annihilation earlier because I sort of interpreted Annihilation about being about the sort of duality or, or unity or the kind of Ouroboros that is creation and destruction. Like they kind of lead into each mm. other. One begets the next, and that's kind mm. of very much what this movie's about, right? Like. The sun is this huge, powerful, destructive force. Like literally, it obliterates them the closer they get to it. They miss. They change their trajectory by a single degree, and it kills them all. Uh, the very, the very first scene we see, scene we see is Cliff Curtis sitting down watching the sun to the observation room at two percent. Mm-hmm. He's like, "Can we turn it up to four? And the computer's like, "Absolutely not. We can turn it up to three. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's like this. It the sun is this huge hugely destructive force but it's also the source of all life in our known universe so it's they're using the idea of the sun as the the duality of creation and destruction because it's constantly doing both things right like that's how the sun is is powered right Right. it's like by atoms colliding it's it's fission or explosion or fusion i'm not a scientist fission i believe i believe it's birth and death simultaneously though for sure exactly yeah. so what it's a handy like a, symbol a yeah. perfect metaphor for god and there's a repeated motif about like the beauty of destruction like they listen to i think it's pinbacker's first transmission where he's talking about like a bunch of tiny yeah. particles of space debris happen to hit them but because in space that is terrifying because those particles are going millions right. of miles an hour it just tore right. their uh, part of their ship apart but he's like i was looking at it and it was beautiful and mm-hmm. like the doctor's obsessed with looking at the sun and like when the captain's getting roasted, he's just screaming at the captain. What do you see? What are you seeing? I love that scene. Yeah. That and scene, Kappa's final pivotal. moment of life, of course, is behind him is the technology bomb thing. That's uh, you know, core, but for the sun and it's beautiful. And in front of him is the sun and it's beautiful. And yeah. mm. it presumably burns up, but like he has this mm. moment of, being one with God. And I got to say, and it kind of reminded me of men where, yeah, uh, Garland is smart and cerebral and he likes to go ape shit at the end. Um, yes. And yeah, I agreed very does. wholeheartedly with Abe in 2007. And I'm glad to hear Abe say what he said. And we're same brain. I'm more on board with it now. It didn't bug me yeah. as much. And maybe that's because I've gone through Dr. Strange and no way home. And like, we're so bullshit now about breaking conventions <laughs> yeah. i don't care as much or like you know cloverfield lane happened it's it nice when they the do brain um yeah. and i my big thing about that all i wanted to say on that point really is that it feels to me like the actual feeling of deficiency in the third act in my humble opinion is not because it's untenable but because the nature of the tension shifts to being about, like you said, monster slasher thriller. And I just actually think that Danny Boyle's not as good as that. Or I don't like the choice, the systemic choice he applied to those scenes specifically because uh, if you know Danny Boyle, yeah, he's directed a shit ton of music videos. And I would say whenever the sun demon attacks, it kind of feels more like a music video where they're just throwing imagery at you yeah. and like doing twisty shit. And they have they, an explanation they for that. They eschew yeah. geography 
And that's my mm. only big thing to like add to the conversation is I agree. Um, just like born supremacy or what have you. I think that's why the action in the third act doesn't feel tense. You don't understand that's, the geography. Shit is just happening. That's my biggest, my big, well, I have two big gripes about the film. My biggest gripe is the final scene within the actual payload. The geography is immediately confusing. Uh, like I have no, I like, yeah, gravity's fucked. They like, well, it's I, a I, Escher painting. Right. And I assumed like this time, like it's very, very subtle. And I think you're right, Michael, about ha now that we've had like two, a, a decade and a half of like Doctor Strange and multiverses and shit, we're much more like our brains are much more able to just, to just see something and be like, oh, this is like some universe breaking shit. Got it. Because it's in the movie, but it's very subtle. They mention that the closer you get to the sun, space and time distort. And they only really mention it twice. So, like, if you've forgotten mm. all that over the course of the movie by the third act, it's like, like, remembering it this time, it sort of made it make a little more sense. Although the, I still argue that the geography of that final scene is very frustrating. Um, it's very frustrating. Yeah. Compared but I, to Devs, I, that chamber at the end. Yeah. Yeah. I get it this time. Like, it's much better done in Devs. Like, Devs, it's always clear. But like, I, 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 I guess I understand the thematic reason for doing it. It just made the actual action of what's happening in, in the final scene uh, confusing. Yeah, it's all <clears throat> that's old school, man. That is old school sci fi. If, if we're going to talk about influences and stuff, the reason I think Danny Boyle is doing this weird like obscuring with light, cutting quickly, abstraction, no geography because that's that's how 2001 did it baby and that's like that's the main read that's how you make a sci-fi movie and that's how people made sci-fi movies after and like uh, well, there's, what was that's it? How silent you make, running that's and how you stuff make like a that. serious artistic award-worthy sci-fi i feel it's like how you, yeah. there's one other model which is flash gordon to star wars and so on true true I've, but i mean i'm just talking about when we're getting into the like the psychological terror yeah, of yeah. sci-fi solaris space is, out is there. another it's one terrible. Fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. You you show the kind of abstraction, I and it's not everyone's cup of tea. I I honestly am with you guys. It's I think it's a tactic that is one of the failures of the movie. Uh, I do think that there's they had an impossible tactic, and I think they did nail some of the stuff, which is something that Danny Boyle said which he said uh, he was speaking about light as the enemy. He's like, quote, there's quite a challenge because the way you generate fear in cinema is darkness. And he literally was uh, seeking a movie where light is the thing to fear. And I think there's shots of Killian Murphy, you know, like looking upon the, you know, looking at, as the wave of photons and fucking radiation are coming at him. And he, and he's about to die kind of thing that really does, show how darkness feels safe in this movie. Oh, yeah. And light feels uh, tumultuous and violent. That's also uh, what Rob Zombie said about Devil's Rejects, by the way. And it does scan when you watch it. Does it, scan. If you yeah. make, it does scan. I think he accomplishes part of the same task just by making the light blinding, right? It's The effect is the same. Right. You can't see the danger. But it's when you, when you activate or deploy it. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is, he does it, in a perfect amount, except for when we're dealing I, with this monster, like you guys. Well, are. I see. I like the abstraction on the monster on Mark Strong. Mm -hmm. Like I like that they distort a light around him by making it look like like waves of heat coming off hot asphalt. Mm -hmm. Um, and like that, I understand. Like I understand. And plus, he's been dancing near the space time continuum for the past seven years. So, like I. I understand and appreciate the abstraction when it's applied to a character. I actually think that's when it's most effective. It's like when you apply the abstraction to the environment, it gets tricky for me, especially when, especially because they, he, to, unless I was particularly dense during this viewing, I don't think he does it any other time. Like it's pretty literal up until that point. I mean, there's flash, there's flash kind of going yeah. mad, but he's the only one who truly is abstracted uh, or in like character or like, thing right although cliff curtis's obsession immediately tips you as you're like that's odd for a scientist yeah, yeah. he's also acting getting odd. sunburn yeah yeah 
they sort of use him to tip you off immediately that oh people are gonna go crackers on this dude i i mean i i know this wouldn't be good but i almost wish when i went into this movie the first the first time someone tapped me on the shoulder and said like it's hp lovecraft in space um because the cosmic horror element and maybe that's a failing i don't know didn't fully come across to me even though mm. I now you're like, obviously I see it. They're in space and they go crazy. But I just didn't see the tie to cosmic horror, which is funny because it's literally cosmic. Yeah. Um, mm. And I wish I did. That makes me like it better. I yeah. I think I reject that too. Or I res- rather, I don't reject it. I just I don't. Mean, there's no unthinkable monster. Other than, yeah, it doesn't. The sun, but it doesn't feel like a weird thing. Out- <laughs> yeah, outside of the general like the unknowable nature of God and the fact that destruction and creation is the same terrifying unknowable force. It's just to what end is it being utilized? Exactly. This became more of uh, more of like an internal thriller to me. Like the last act really works for me because it sort of shifts your understanding of what was happening in the first two acts. In the first two acts, you're looking at this noble mission to save humanity, right? And it's mm-hmm. like, it's a series of tough calls that they have to make and they de- they deploy their cold logic to make these decisions. I and, fucking love that so And it's, much. yeah, it's really good. And then you have Chris Evans in there as somebody else who's also using cold logic, but he's like... I love the line at one point. He goes, what are you trying to do? Remind us of our lost humanity? Yeah. <laughs> Such a dick thing to say. But, but, but so but it's, on but it's, I'm the one apologizing, all right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Was that the apology? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Accept it. It's, it's true in that <laughs> yeah. scene, though. It's like, well, what's the fucking point? Like, oh, if you're trying to make remind me of our humanity, we have like 45 <laughs> minutes to save all of the world. <laughs> Let's Someone's just do the gonna thing. die. They're He's all like, suicidal. Uh, yeah. Back on track. Jesus. Let's just do the thing, right? And they're like, "Oh yeah, right. Thank you for reminding me." We right. Do Fuck your opinion. This isn't a democracy. Yeah. So he's he's a little bit more impassioned, but he still he feels like uh, sometimes I guess it, it even stronger force like when the others are like, "Oh, that's too cruel." He's like, "No, we have to do that because we have to stick to the mission." Anyway, the point is that the first two acts of the movie are all about this. We have to stick to the mission. It's the most important thing in the history of, of humankind. But then it gets to act three and we get this pinbacker character in here and we start to get more internal and it gets more claustrophobic as the cast is whittled down and they're making these, like they sit down to decide whether or not they're going to murder their crewmates. They can accomplish their mission. And with the repeated motifs of eyes and God and creation, it starts to be like, to me anyway, a movie about wanting to be God. Because you have the two different sides of of that argument or that coin, I guess, between Pinbacker Mm -hmm. and the mission. And the Icarus mission, like Kappa and everybody else, they want to be God by creating, right? They want to be the saviors of humanity. Whereas Pinbacker has this whole line where like, no, God has deemed it our time to die. I want to be the last man alive so that I can have that intimate moment with God before I die. Like I want to be the one that brings humanity to heaven and serve God. If that's what God wants, he says this in like different words. If that's what God wants, that's what should happen. Obviously. Yeah. So he wants to be God by destruction. So like to me, act three is about, again, it's, it's just further reflecting that idea of the creation, destruction being the same force and then nature of God and everything. But it's just like they one side wants to be God by creating. The other one wants to be God by destroying. And they kind of do both because they do destroy themselves. Duality. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, they, but and, they succeed. But in they succeed. Yeah. The and reigniting the sun, this powerful That's destructive force that will continue to. Yeah. Royal. I think and of course, we constantly me. navigate uh, or at least Western Christian culture navigates uh, between scary God or loving God. Right. Is God scary? Is God loving? So that's all woven in there, obviously, in a way. I, like. uh, I think you kind of convinced me. I was going to, I don't think the movie's precisely about that. Like, I, I think that if you based just looking at quotes from Boyle and Garland and stuff like that, they definitely are talking about that kind of stuff. But I think the, the clear thing they want to kind of diagnose with the movie mm-hmm. is how humanity not necessarily our ability to touch god but how human humanity in our cre- in our own creation reacts to the unknown and they kind of show three very practical or three very real events one is 
you approach it with calculation and like scientifically in an order, in other words, the logical, mm -hmm. you approach it with awe and serenity and like seeing it for its beauty or the emotional, or you approach it with faith and purpose and kind of zealotry, the spiritual, and you get characters that kind of fall into these buckets. And it's interesting how I think that they do have kind of a form of justice that comes along with it, which someone could argue is the movie's god you know the 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 thing that says you get this you get this you get this because of these acts that you did because of what you believe or whatnot um but it being a garland joint uh he likes to be kind of fussy when it comes down to you know this is a hard and fast rule of life he likes it messy he wants you to like engage with what is there what is this character's like attempted purpose is it right or wrong guess what it's both baby um and i think that that is a really kind of cool approach to how do you find kind of like you have a lot of morally uncomplicated characters in this it's a cool way to throw at your characters like Chris Evans, who's kind of like the head, like the, the king morally uncomplicated. He's just like, fuck you motherfuckers. We need to save our planet. Uh, and everyone else is like, well, can we do that? At one point, Cassie slash, you know, Rose Byrne is like, uh, I, I'm, you're telling, you're asking me for my vote. I'm telling you, I can't give it to you because I'm not going to kill my friend, even if he wants to die and we need somebody to die. I'm not going to make that decision. And so he, He's the guy who's kind of determined that he's no things are not complicated we need to do one thing one function then that's it and in this case he's probably right and i love that and i feel like a lot of um yeah, movies like, don't uh, represent that there's literally nothing that could be more important than completing this mission may i offer a counter argument no <laughs> no yeah exactly <laughs> and that's the thing and like garland as he uh, is wont to do is going to say you think you're morally uncomplicated you're kind of the cause of all of this. And then you're going to blame other people for being the cause of this. Everyone's kind of uh, a victim and, uh, you know, the the assaulty uh, in this case. Just like the uh, so Yeah. So he's like, yeah, even the most morally uncomplicated character that I can think of that you're like, yep, he's awesome. He's going to find flaws and make him die kind of a pathetic death. And it's kind of cool. Um, so I don't know. That's my read on like the... The whole like what they're trying to do reactions to the unknown is really what I gathered this v Gi view through. Given that read, what do you th or do either of you think that there's a reason that Kappa? Why is Kappa the the one who wins, or you know, does because the he's best. he's final girl. He's uh he's literally Oppenheimer. He's the he's the creator of the bomb. Well, he is now. That's that's so yeah. funny, actually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so because he because oh, he because he am become death, Michael. <laughs> he's oh, the yeah. best of us. He am become that death, moment. and death am become life. And of course, that's why it's a bomb. Yeah. Right. The whole death gives so life. My reaction to that is that Kappa, as it's said several times, he's a higher priority to keep alive because his job is at the final act of yeah, the mission. Yeah, he's got to make the bomb. So yeah. with humanity, it's not just you can't just determine importance by putting everyone on a grid and saying this is the most important person. You're a doctor, you're a lawyer, you're you know a technician, whatever. It's in the moment that also has resonance. So there's special moments in life where the technician or the barber is the most important thing in the world. And in this case, it's a bomb. So he's the one who gets to last live the longest. Does that imply uh, he's the most morally pure? Do you think? No, I think it's okay. literally just, it's I think functional. That's, he's the last it's piece functional. of the puzzle. I, yeah. I think it's a Danny Boyle, Alex Garland joint. And I think that the, they're pretty they're nihilistic, nihilistic or like, yeah, yeah, they like stuff to just happen. Like an optimistic nihilism. Right. Yeah. Uh, hey, I wanted to ask, and there was a tiny moment of silence, so it's a good time. Uh, yeah. This feels like an elevated version of life. Did y'all like life? <laughs> life? I, I think it's. A, I just want to say to people out there, like, if you liked the feeling of this movie, I I also recommend life. Tom, life is the one it? where, if I'm correct, unless there's another movie uh -huh. called Life, where they're there like is. a alien. Is it the one with um? The alien comes aboard and just starts fucking up everything. Yeah, they they find they discover yeah. alien life for the first like black time, goo. and it's just a little paramecium piece of bullshit, and they're so ben -em, ben -em, ben -em. excited <laughs> in a very realistic way like this. 
but slowly but surely it grows and grows and grows until like this it's like a totally reality breaking monster. Whereas the first half of the movie, you thought it was going to be pretty grounded and it's very exciting and and more well-made than it needed to be. Some very Mm -hmm. harrowing moments. Yes. There is also another movie called life though, about uh, (laughs) Eddie Murphy and Martin Lawrence. That's right. uh, Being Mm -hmm. wrongly imprisoned for life in the South in like the forties. Also a good movie. I think there's also another one, but it's as a house. So, well, that's the best of all. Life, the best of as we know, the only it. one, um, the only one that features Aiden Christensen jerking off Sad while Vader. choking himself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Life it's the only house. one that features him falling off of the house. Mm-hmm. True. Um, well, I haven't. Yeah, I was gonna say I haven't seen Life, uh, but the movie is story-wise almost beat for beat Event Horizon. Yeah, that's uh, this that's movie. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. I was like, "Are we still off track?" Where I dragged us, or yes? No, 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 no. Also, no. Yeah. No, I agree <laughs> completely. Up. And that's Lovecraftian. Is it yeah. inherent? Yep. Yeah, because it's the it's a light hole you... instead of a black hole. Yeah, that's it. Well, it's <laughs> it's a light hole. It's uh. Well, I mean, it's the idea of walking up to the precipice. It's it's uh the fucking inferno, dude. It's just like uh, crossing the barrier into the den of souls, you mm-hmm. know, the way in which we can perceive ourselves in a new light uh, and see ourselves in a more pure or more creationist kind of perspective. Um, it's it's wild. I think that's uh, I think Event Horizon. Mm-hmm. Paul Anderson, Paul W S Anderson. W S to get He's that W S. That's there. a heavy hitter, man. <laughs> yeah. It's a heavy hitter. No, but I, I mean, it's not just the idea of it. It's like the beats of the story. It's the ship gets out there. It's a ship that's mm-hmm. been deserted for seven years. They are forced to get on board the other ship because their ship gets disabled. There is a crazy person on board who has disfigured his own body, who is running around murdering people. The ending is the person has to detach the ship and fly the other half of the ship into the big dangerous thing and blow himself up. Hell yeah. Also it's Armageddon. Same shit. Yeah, but that describes both to a T. That's true, yeah. It's yeah. true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, do, uh, I don't know what that means. <laughs> it just struck me when I was watching nothing. this it's, movie. <laughs> I mean, so if you look at like the design of the movie and you and like you read uh, what they were saying that they were using Das Boot for like the uh, for the claustrophobia. It's totally of related to submarine movies, right? As oh, yeah. many space oh, movies. Yeah. Solaris, right. Solaris, because space as a kind of Lovecraftian like liminal fish, space. Yeah, yeah, liminal space. Two thousand one, just in general design, and the thing I mentioned earlier, Alien. How they kind of crew community rooms, discussions of the mission, re- very reminiscent of how Alien did, how Alien got us familiar with a big group of people and how they're both alike and also dissimilar event horizon they mention because of all the things you mentioned a, a oh John so they're Carpenter's, aware all right that actually John, makes yeah. me ding it a notch because it is ding very it very close it's very close yeah uh john carpenter's dark star for obvi- like ah, i think yeah. obvious reasons of like pro- again pr- approaching the precipice and uh, uh douglas uh, trummel's silent running which kind of is in the same category and also has a lot of design like that movie really did make us go. Oh, what if space was like, I don't know, just like kind of look like some 70s shit, you know, like it's <laughs> everything's kind of just like, oh, you got what gears. If you, gotta, you need a wrench yeah. to do the space shit. Uh, and I love that shit. And so that's the kind of design of the movie as according to the creators. And I think those are I think they did a great job kind of pulling from all those buckets Boyle's very good at that i think yeah i don't have a response um, to that so i'm gonna launch this in another direction i really please. liked the line and thought darkness is like that space is an absence and therefore like dying in space is different than dying in the sun in the sense that quote darkness is separate because it's an absence but light is something it envelops you and becomes you uh i really like just that concept and then compare that to the earth room, which is this not holodeck because they're not that ambitious and, and that's good because that would be too much for this film. Uh, it's like a little projector booth 
that can project just a very a somewhat convincing like simulacrum of a nice earth space around you presumably so they don't go insane on the ship right and that's also light enveloping you but yeah. it doesn't kill you but one guy commits suicide in there so it does there, yeah. so just like annihilation where the more you dig in the more you find that i think a typical of garland and boyle seems to have supported him in this endeavor uh they are like arrested development or like he loves if there's a motif it's in there like 56 times it's like yeah. get out level mm -hmm. encoding and uh and they do a good job of it so i just it is cool to rewatch i like movies you can rewatch and notice more where you're like oh yeah that's also enveloping light <laughs> you know right and you see if you see their previous two before this they had two collaborations which is in 2000 the beach and in 2002 28 days later both written by Alex Garland directed by Danny Boyle I think you get that from those movies as well. Um, Garland gets up to some pretty, like, I don't know, for lack of a better word, Machiavellian tricks with his characters. You know, he wants you to either really hate them or really root for them. And he, like, is just cackling in the background, like, ah, ha, ha, it's not going to go the way you want it to mm -hmm. go. Um, and that's, I think, kind of speaks to kind of what you're saying, too, about, like, themically, they really do... Um, approach it that way they want you t they have an agenda and it's it's almost always like a very dense one but and one that um really really makes for a like a somber result mm -hmm. um no one gets out happy or gets out no. <laughs> you know especially not michelle yo <laughs> yeah i thought it was a little much for her to die in a pose holding a plant but um i do love her b arc and again the death life combo of yeah not just her thing burns so life is death mm -hmm. but also she's the one who suggests well why don't we just <laughs> Why don't we just execute three of the crew? Because then there would be enough oxygen for us to get there, which is uh, it's in line with the kinds of no nonsense decisions they make. But I would say of all of them, it's the least flexible. She very quickly goes to like, we could just kill three of us. And it's clearly to protect the plants. So like she's a nurturer of life, but she also brings death. Uh, you can only uh a, you can only sustain life yes. through death. Like, mm -hmm. right. You can't, I don't know. I almost wish like there were lingering zoom ins on the manure in, the, you know, that feeds the plants. Cause that's also death from life. I think it's also, they're doing like a Goldilocks thing. Life is so unique and precious because you need to be like the perfect things need to align. It needs to be the right resources during the right time at the right distance. And that's the kind of, calculate calculus that like three out of seven people need to die because there's not enough oxygen for everyone to breathe for this amount of time um i love that you just don't see movies about people who like know they're gonna die you know i always think that movies give you hope because we don't like the nihilism involved but many stories great stories had key players who kind of um like had an experience like that how many uh, like, uh, like extraordinary events, uh, uh, you know, happened and were involved with people who knew they were going to die. It's really cool. Or at least and most likely going to die. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, Jen's watching the days right now about the Fukushima disaster. And of course it compares to Chernobyl. Um, yeah, I think of situations like that where you have a bunch of scientists who know they're going to die and they slowly, they just do the calculus. I like that mm. it's not perfectly that. There are cracks, right? One guy, the captain, is not, he can't really hold his shit together. So they're not all that cooled and calculated. And Wong, uh, Benedict Wong like is like very upset with him for obvious reasons. But I mean, like they do have emotions. They just constantly are forced to reel it back in, we gotta save reel humanity, it reel it back in, mm -hmm. stuff right. it down. Like, you'll be dead so soon that your feelings don't matter. Just set them aside. You're just gonna die, do this thing. I Yeah, Hell we don't yeah. see, I can't think of that a lot. We see so many movies where you think you're gonna, you're surely gonna die, but at the last second, you don't. I mean, obviously, right, yeah. that's you're the saved. primary template. Because we wanna be happy, we wanna well, go home we and hope be happy. that's what would happen to us. Yeah. That's right. Incidentally, well, no, I won't spoil life, because... This isn't the episode. So the life don't podcast. That's right. Never yeah. mind. Okay, back to the thing. Do you guys really <laughs> think that eighty percent of dust is human skin? Because I'll shoot myself in the head right fucking now. I think. What else could it be? 
I thought it was little particles of rocks or just like, you know, sand. Like, air sand. I guess it could be like paint <laughs> peeling from the wall and stuff, but like yeah. we're the most active paint participant in our environments. Them. Fuck. I'm very I think it's a different this. makeup. I, I sure. think it's a different makeup, but, oh, but I'm a dust I mean, expert. I mean, certainly part of it is that they incinerated the crew, right? And that ash has just been circulating. Oh, maybe Cliff Curtis is referring specifically to their situation. That's what to I'm going to choose situation. to believe and not Google. For not them. Google <laughs> yeah, yeah. Is, the, is what I've been brushing on my <laughs> Honestly, teeth every day. One of the most horrifying <laughs> moments in the movie to me. Yeah, I, Curtis I legitimately... just says apropos of almost nothing. 80% of dust is human skin. I'm like, oh, shit. Like, fuck off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What the fuck? <laughs> and speaking of how the fact the fact that they do technically foreshadow, uh, surely the hardest has to be when one of them says, yeah, right, we can't split up or we'll all get picked off by aliens. <laughs> yeah. Very yeah, funny exactly. in retrospect. Yeah, I mean, they foreshadow uh, everything. Yeah, like, which I didn't give them credit for the first time. I felt mm. so jarred. It actually is like No Country, a movie from the same year as I referenced uh, the first time I watched that in theaters. When it ended, people in the audience audibly went, what? Or like, where's the scene with, <laughs> what the fuck happened? And we left and I said to my dad, like, it was as good, The t- like the scenes were as engaging as Coen Brothers movies, but I didn't really like that. It seemed like it didn't mean anything at the end. I could not be more wrong, obviously, as you watch it over and over. And I feel like this is not as good as No Country for Old Men, but it is as ballsy in its own way, and I didn't give it credit for that. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, it's as how ambitious. Cool, how cool is that scene when they're like, okay, we did it. Everyone... The- Requisite number of people had to die. We can now breathe and make it 19 hours to Chris our Pine destination. is frozen, which is good. That's yeah. good. <laughs> and we're going to die. I, I, in 19 hours, we're going to all blow up. But, you know, we're going to s- jumpstart the sun like the core. Um, <laughs> like, so there's this scene where Killian Murphy's talking to the computer and it's just like, the computer's like, you're going to die too soon. You're not going to be able to complete the mission. And he's like, what are you, fuck are you talking about? We, we, what is it? Someone lying is like, is, is Michelle Yeoh lying? They're like, no, that no, she's just wrong. And, uh, there's and not enough. Like, oxygen, why, yeah. why is there not enough oxygen? We did the math and he just is confounding him. And he's just like, well, it's because there's too many people. And he's like, what the fuck are you talking about? And then when it dawns on him where he's like, there's five crew members. How many people are there? There are five he's like, people. Where's aboard. the fifth crew yeah. member? And the, the, right just the behind cold, you. haunting <laughs> indifference of, the fifth crew member, unknown, is in the observation lounge. And it's just like, yeah. oh, fuck. I just love, like, 2001, how it effectively uses the whole dialogue with, like, an empty machine. Right. And, it's and just yeah, the uncaring and nature of yeah. the universe is functioning against I you to fuck you. Super like, the other memorable scene. I think moment that rhymes with that is uh, really effective to me, always, <laughs> when it very calmly goes, like, uh, I should tell you, there is a fire in the aeroponics bay. Cut to, (laughs) like the whole thing just fucking gone instantaneously, super close up. And you're like, oh, God, (laughs) how fucked could they be? I love that moment. Yeah. It's pretty brutal. There's another another scene with Chris Evans where he's making a decision of we should just blast that room with uh, oxygen to flash fire, essentially, get the burn to stop. And everyone's like, that will kill it all, though. That means it's it's like that will literally kill all of the plants. And he's like, it's already gone. Yeah, catch and up. I, that's already done. That's yeah. a, it's already <laughs> it's already gone. And that's very reminiscent to me of like Interstellar when he's like, it's necessary. You know, like it's just like one of those things where it's just like you're very, yeah, very keen observation. Uh, mm. You need to do a thing right now because in space time is very important and you don't have it because uh, you're going very fast and it's all out of scale. Uh, it's kind of cool. I kind of like those conversations. Uh, very utilitarian, you know? Yeah. Um, Did you guys? So, oh, go ahead. Well, I was just going to mention something I've written mm-hmm. down. 
two things or two parter about scientists in this movie. First off, uh, the physics advisor that they brought onto the film is a uh, is a Scottish guy, I think. Uh, his name's Brian Cox. He was, if you <laughs> follow our work, uh, not Cody that Brian and I, Cox. Not the Brian Cox who's in Succession. The physicist Brian Cox from the UK, uh, where uh, he was the guy that we used as the. Uh, basics for marvels of the science cody johnson and i cracked when we made that show yeah professor scott watch bug professor scott bug is essentially an imitation thing, yeah. and he is the he's who's based on and he was the uh, technician for this event oh yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, cody watched that you know a bunch of his show and was like i'm toying like with this a, character of what if brian cox just said untrue things <laughs> just untrue yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, and also then, our um, own pod bewilderments and scientifics if you like yeah. that character check that if out you like that character and stuff like that anyway that's he was on who i film. brought that's to cody I'm, when yeah. i was like you should do this voice yeah. uh scientists in general though looking at this movie criticize the movie like in a very neil degrasse tyson way if you know who he is he was the guy who was like i ah, titanic the stars are wrong um and scientists of this movie were saying shit like you need a billion bombs and the artificial gravity at the end is like so wrong and and they called danny boyle one one scientist called danny boyle a boy with a calculator which i'm just like what i, I mean I, there's a movie. like scientists obviously you need a <laughs> obviously it wouldn't really work yeah, yeah, like you can't shoot a bomb yeah, obviously movie, it's nonsense i hate not that. only that the movie know. is like a love note to right. scientific thought in a way that we've never really had and yes it has inconsistencies but in order to they're just there to get the audiences to get in that insane intense mindset and if you don't see that my only thing is you're a, you're a, you're a fucking nerd what so. if you could stand right at the edge of the sun you can't though okay did you hear the first two words of the sentence that i said yeah. Yeah. what if you yeah. could <laughs> yeah. this is a fucking make them up <laughs> this is a make them up it's because it's so close that's that's when you know you got a good which i have I to say in our defense of piss course, off scientists this complaint gets lobbed at cracked because because that was what we did to stuff, but only when it's entertaining to think through, like Jason Voorhees having to ride a bike or drive a exactly, car. Exactly, yeah. Not when it makes the movie like less fun. That's not how you use that power. Not, Much like I, the sun, it must be used correctly. Yeah, I think a lot of people misunderstood that about what we a lot of what we did in Cracked Words. That's right. Most they thought it was just from, teardowns. It's like, no, it's funny teardowns. No, it's, That's it's, the it's, point. It's a, it's a further <laughs> celebration of movies that we obsess at. Like, we love these mm -hmm. movies yeah. for the most part. Yeah. I think with movies like this, they and like Titanic and such, uh, when it is done, when you actually try and you get most of it right, like you get 75% of it right or whatever, it bring all out of the woodwork comes all the nerds who are like, Ah, it's close it to perfect. the perfect. Right. And then they wouldn't have said that shit if it was fucking Fantastic Four or some If they didn't hear it all, they just wouldn't watch it. Right. Right. Yeah. Because so when it comes down to it, I think that like if you make a movie that is trying to be scientifically minded and tries some stuff and like has like hyperspace or some shit and everyone agrees it's kind of magic or whatnot but you do most of it right and they just have some you know gripes about like the fucking you know gravity being wrong or some shit or where's artificial gravity in this movie there's no there's no spire that spins like 2001 and there's no like how do you solve that well they didn't have a line about it you motherfucker get the point is i think you're doing a great job if you get those idiots to come out and complain because it means that you're close enough to the real thing that most audiences will be like damn that felt real mm -hmm. that's my thought on it though who knows someone will probably be like uh but technically you're wrong yeah uh another thing i noticed this time uh well, we mentioned the gold spacesuits. I did want to say those are super cool. The design of anything that you that protects you from the sun, like the giant reflective Fresnel lens, the golden space, the to welding torch space helmets, all very cool. We just haven't mentioned the visuals, and they are good. But that's not what I wanted to say. I want to say I hate naming characters whenever I write stuff. Um, do you think the names are anything in this, or or I think to or an made extent up? So. because I Mace is the most abrasive. Corazon is pretty abrasive. Surl is surly. Corazon leads with her heart. 
Sir, I'm Cyril, a deep Cyril also <laughs> Cyril also feels like a sort of an anagram of sealed and seared, which is kind of what ah, happens to him. Which is what happens. He gets sealed and seared. Keeps uh, those juices right in there. Yeah. Also, think- Kappa, of course, carries water in a depression in his head. <laughs> that joke's just for me, I guess. <laughs> I guess that's just for me. Um, fuck. Pinbacker is a reference to something. I, I, they say that enough I think that I'm from, like, what does that name mean? It's got to mean something. I think Pinback, which I believe, as you re- referenced, the San Diego uh, musician uh, or San Diego band. band. They're probably referencing um, the same thing. Pinback though. is referencing, and Pinbacker, I think, is a reference to Carpenter's Dark Star, where uh, there was this character, Sergeant Pinback. Um, I think that's it. That makes sense. Yeah, that sounds Thank about right. Thank you for doing the research on the interviews and inspirations. Oh, yeah. I love this movie. This is one of my low-key, like, obsessive movies just because it's there's so much going on in it that I like. Um, one of the things that I fucking love, because you, Michael knows my absolute nerd out at first images. Um, the first shot, it seems like a distant shot of the sun, like but it's actually the reflector dish of the ship. And when we rotate around it, you can see the makeup of the ship. It's, yeah. It feels like Star Wars. It's and like it's everything showing you need is in the shot. It's proving to you the system, oh. which is you can't look at the sun directly. The camera exactly. can't even look at the sun directly. We're not going to look at the sun in this movie. Right. We're just going to look Till at the, the ship. That's right. crazy. Yep. Yeah, and of course, end. halfway through the rotation, it briefly looks like an eyeball. And so, yeah, it does a lot of work. Chef's kiss, baby. Mm. Chef's kiss. Mm. I love that shit. Yeah. Movies do that. It's pretty dope. The surface of the sun looks pretty crazy, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And how about the music? John Murphy, who did the uh, score to, also did the score to 28 Days Later, which has a banger, that that opening sequence. Uh, Fucking find this movie is like a perfect mix of haunting score but also like score that i would put on if i'm like i want to meditate right now sure (laughs) you know uh yeah it's a really it's a really cool score and not Mm -hmm. it's not as yeah like you said it's not it's it's a little haunting but it's not as thriller or like horror tinged as you might expect um it's much more grand it's it's it 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 feels much more aligned with like the themes of the movie rather than like the dark craziness of the third act or something. Right. And it's definitely of that time when we're all crazy for like explosions of sky and Sigaros and Godspeed you black emperor. And these are, Oh, were we all? (laughs) Yeah. I think movies. I mean, yeah. Okay. I think it was a lot of movies. That shit. Oh, you, you're hard against too uh, diffuse. I'm not hard against. I just found all the diffuse stuff too diffuse. I'm like, uh, I get it. I feel poignant. That's enough of that. Explosions in the sky. I feel you poignant. discovered the chords that come at the end of touching episodes. What I do you, just, what I understand. music do you want? I don't Hey, know. I like tons of music. <laughs> this is a different discussion. <laughs> yeah, it is. I like Gregorian <laughs> chant and barbershop <laughs> quartet. You know this. Simultaneous. Yes, yeah, sim- yeah, they weave in and out between each other. It's beautiful. Oy. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah! But yeah, I think uh, meticulously well done movie. Stack cast, great crew in terms of like what they accomplished. Some people don't act, like Act Three. It seems like the three of us are kind of cool with it. I soften yeah. on it. It's I like I couldn't. Well, I can't think of because so I'm not saying I could write, but maybe there's such a thing as an even more satisfying, you know, version of the third act. Um, It's not like my favorite third act ever, but I've Mm -hmm. totally accepted that it's legitimate and it's it's a fine that they did that move. That is Mm -hmm. acceptable to me. (laughs) It is uh, not. It didn't. I thought it broke the movie and it doesn't. It's good. It's still a very good movie. Uh, I do think. Annihilation in some ways is almost expressing, you know, there's theme overlap there where he's like, I'm going to really crush that or take another swing at that weird sci-fi life is death is life vibe. Yeah. 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 (laughs) Yeah. And to some extent the beach. Yeah. For real. I think that's what I did not see the beach. Is that wait? That's That's DiCaprio and Madonna. Mm -hmm. Wait, there's sci-fi in that. Yeah, dude. What do you think? What happens to? I thought it was like a. 
Wasn't that made as a wedding present? I mean, I don't know about what yeah, that is. Yeah, I don't know is. about that. Yeah. The point is, I didn't see it. But it was it's Tilda Swinton. What happened? Uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. What's the magic? Does it make the them ma- young? The, it's like the yeah, it kind of yeah. It's a per, it's utopia. Been it's the young. idea of it's the it's the uh, idea of going into Eden and finding Eden and get and Eden gets destroyed. Uh, but it's like magical realism. You'd like it. I don't know. Oh, uh, great. Yeah, Sounds... everything's perfect there, and they and Leo ruins it. He sure that's does. What Leo does. Yeah. Wait, the movie. Or the beach. No, his no, no, he, ru- ruins he ruins the beach. The beach. Right, yeah. right, 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 right. Yeah, can't. he ruins yeah. the experience of, you know. It's like a, it's it kind of. It sounds like it's a garden e- of Eden it's like allegory. A mora- <laughs> yeah, it's an allegory. It's kind of mor- like, kind of got that morality play thing going, like Lord of the Flies, you know, like it's just like the the politics of human, uh, it can't help, they can't help themselves but ruin things. Sure. Um, sure. Well, that's sure. the fifth movie unrelated to the topic that we've synopsized and i do That's think there's some good wrecks good. in there but it also means that we could wrap up right sure yeah, yeah. I, think so. okay. I think so i think so any final thoughts from tom anybody no anybody? i think this movie is uh yeah i think i said everything i wanted to say about this movie i think it's yeah, pretty yeah, good yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh yeah, i I, i'm uh, I, we, we, were, we were talking about the theme a minute ago. I know the theme gets used in so much, and I can't figure this out for sure. My brain is telling me that it's the theme in the Nicole Kidman AMC ad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? It might be. I don't well, know if it's that accurate, but like, it feels. It, they really do use it in like so many other movies, mm-hmm. commercials, trailers. It gets used constantly. So it was. Yeah. It was jarring coming back to this movie and hearing that theme and being like oh this is where that comes from right it's that poignant mm. shit that swaim hates yeah uh, life has become death <laughs> yeah <laughs> so thanks for All listening right. listener it's okay that you can't reply because i know everything you want to say remember yeah. you'll know and we've we succeeded agree. eight minutes after we deliver the podcast so if you wake up one morning and it's a beautiful day you'll know we made the podcast <laughs> We'll see you in a couple years. That's right. No more podcasts for a couple years, fuckers. Enjoy this one. (laughs) Nah, thanks to Very Baked Potato for the topic. Good topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Uh, You can, I mean, we're going to have a thing that says it, but patreon.com slash small beans if you don't listen till the end. Uh, Let's do some plugs for the Thomas. Mm -hmm. Thomas, speak for a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, Well, you can find me and and my buddy Dave, David Bell, over at Gamefully Unemployed. We're sort of the sister network to uh, Small Beans. If you you listen to Small Beans, you're a Small Beans patron. You probably already know about us. Uh, But you can head on on over to gamefullyunemployed.com com to check out our a link to our teespring store and you can also check out our patreon at patreon.com slash gamefully unemployed um yeah i think that's probably it yep. huge huge news for me i did not know you guys had a proprietary site is that new or have i just not known this oh it's just a little there's nothing there but like a link to our teespring store it's Great. nothing it's like Good nothing stuff. at all <laughs> i'm looking at it now it says, yeah, fucking no web page here. Click this. <laughs> Great. Good job, Dave. I assume. It's a, real, it's a, real it's Dave a very move, Dave yeah. page, yeah. yeah. Dave yeah. Move. It's got Shiva on uh, there. Hell yeah, it does. Uh, uh, I right. try when I can to uh, say what the slate is going to yeah. be for the people or Patreon. So if you're listening to this, uh, the day it comes out on Patreon, it's Friday the 7th of the July of 2023. Uh, what we got happening next week is a big Gamefully Unemployed slash uh, Small Beans week where we have Star Trek The Next Futurama on Monday. Mm-hmm. And then on Friday, we got Ready Player One. For some spiel boys featuring these two guys. Um, so that's so that's yeah, nothing if you're uh if you're just listening to this free, but if you're you know on the Patreon, you get both of those episodes, which is kind of dope. And just to tip a little more, the Star Trek The Next Futurama we are on is a pharaoh to remember, the one where Bender is a pharaoh. Very good yeah. episode. Very good yeah. episode. Yeah. Oh, we got man. more director piece theaters in store, more frame r- frame rates like this one, and some. I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Bonus episodes. Keep the hits keep coming here at Small Beans, and we want to thank you for listening. 
Thanks again, Very Baked Potato. You can be like Very Baked Potato right now. Go to patreon.com slash smallbean. Pick the flick tier. Pick the flick. Pick the flick. Goodbye for several years. Goodbye for (laughs) several years. (laughs) 